Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, good morning, whatever the case may be. Uh, so this is a continuation of our discussion on chemistry, and we're going to be going through a number of things um, together. So to start off with, let's make an outline of the subjects that we're going to cover in this lecture. So this is uh, chapter two. We're still in chapter two. And we'd already gone through um, some preliminary um, discussions. Well, not preliminary. We had another, had another lecture in which we are talking about uh, water and the properties of water. Now we're going to move on and talk about the compounds of life. So let's go ahead and begin that. And in this lecture, we're going to be covering the following. We're going to first start off with an overview of inorganic compounds. as well as organic compounds. Then we'll have a little discussion on a uh, three different types of mixtures. And these are going to be solutions, colloids, and suspensions. Now we're going to be talking about these at different times in this course as well as the courses that come later 40B and 40C. Um, so we should understand what a solution is, what a colloid is, and to a lesser extent suspensions. So we'll cover that and talk a little bit about each of those. Then we're going to talk about organic compounds. We're going to spend most of our time actually in this area right here, organic compounds. And we're going to look at uh, four major organic compounds. We're going to talk about carbohydrates, we're going to talk about lipids, We're going to talk about proteins. And when we talk about proteins, we're going to have, we're going to include in that discussion, a discussion on a particular type of protein that's referred to as an enzyme. Enzymes are going to play an extremely important role in your body, or they do. Um, and they're certainly going to be things that we need to understand and talk about uh, in this course, as well as uh, when you go into 40B and 40C, you'll be looking at a variety of different uh, enzymes and what they do and um, how they affect your body and homeostasis. Okay, and then finally, the fourth uh, organic compound. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but this is uh, nucleic acids. And as you may know, nucleic acids refer to DNA and RNA. Um, we are going to spend just a moment talking about them, um, but <clears throat> I also at that point want to bring into discussion on this molecule, ATP. Um, so that is a molecule that you're going to spend uh, quite a bit um, of time talking about, studying, um, and you'll be hearing quite a bit about that uh, in this course <clears throat> as well as the other two courses, 40 B and 40 C. So that's where we're going. And to start, let's begin with that first discussion, which is the um, the inorganic and organic compounds. So we'll go ahead, and I'm going to switch out my pen. I like the blue one a little bit better. Um, I think it shows up a little bit better. So we're going to begin with this inorganic. and organic compounds. Right. So 
we're using this term compound and we should probably define what that is. So let's begin there. A compound, what is that? So a compound is going to be defined as being something that is composed of two or more different elements. Two or more different elements. And I think we all have an understanding what elements are. So that would be um, hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon, so forth and so on. So if you combine those, two or more of those together, what you have is a compound. So if you look at this, that fits that definition, right? We have two, uh, hydrogen and oxygen, two or more. This, that's not a compound because we don't fulfill this definition of two or more different compounds. Okay, so that's our compounds. And that's what we mean when we use that term. All right, let's begin with the inorganic. So when we look at the inorganic, the way we're going to define inorganic is it's going to have a lack of carbon. So it's missing this element, carbon. There's no carbon in the compounds that we refer to as inorganic compounds. Furthermore, they're usually fairly simple molecular structures. So let me give you some examples. So some examples would be that. Okay, no carbon there. Here's another example. Sodium chloride, table salt. Here's another one. Hydrogen chloride, that's a acid. All of these are examples of what we would call inorganic compounds. So the, the key here is a lack of carbon um, in the mixture of uh, elements, okay? What about organic? How do we define organic compounds? So an organic compound obviously is going to contain the element carbon. Okay? So it's going to have carbon as part of its makeup. And usually hydrogen. So I can almost say uh, with a great deal of certainty that all of the organic compounds that we deal with in this class and 40B and 40C will also include hydrogen. I cannot think at the top of my head an exception to that rule. Um, there may be, I just can't think of it, but I doubt it. So um, carbon is a very, very common element in organic compounds, as we'll see. Furthermore, they always have covalent bonds. Okay. That is to say they share electrons. Okay. Now that is not to say that inorganic compounds don't are, aren't composed of um, uh, covalent bonds. They are. And we had an example of that very early on when we talked about water. That two hydrogens connected to an oxygen through covalent bonds did not have carbon so it was an organic compound but it did have covalent bonds but in this case with organic compounds they are always always going to have covalent bonds somewhere in the mixture of the makeup of that molecule okay so again we can talk about some examples 
and these are not hard to come by. So sugars or carbohydrates always uh, uh, have carbon and are held together with covalent bonds. Proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, for example, DNA. Okay. All of these are examples of uh, organic compounds. Okay. There is an exception. There are an exception, or there is an exception. So this molecule, CO2, clearly has carbon in it. It's also uh, held together by covalent bonds, but it is not considered to be an organic compound, even though it fits the description. And the reason is that it's simple. It's too simple um, to really be considered to be part of this group that we call organic compounds. It's just um, an exception to the rule um, because of the simplicity of the way the molecule is put together. Another one, and one that you will be talking about from time to time a lot, is this. And this is bicarbonate. And that's something, that's a molecule that is very important, um, and you'll be running into that in a variety of different systems um, as you go further into the three courses. Uh, um, that's also, as you can see, composed of carbon, um, and it also has hydrogen, um, has covalent bonds, but again, because of the simplicity of the way this molecule is put together, it is not considered to be an organic molecule or organic compound. So, that's kind of an overview. Let's get into some a little bit of detail on inorganic um, compounds. So we're going to turn our attention now to uh, three different types of inorganic compounds. Um, so there are so many inorganic compounds and uh, many of them of course are important for your body but we're not going to focus or not talk about them to any great degree except for these three uh, broad categories. So let's take a look at inorganic Acids, bases, and salts. So these are inorganic compounds, and they have the additional sort of uh, label of either being a salt, a base, or um, an acid. Um, what I want to do is simply define what these things are, and we're going to use a couple of examples to understand their definitions, and then we're going to let it go and really focus on the organic compounds. All right, so let's begin with an acid. So an inorganic acid. How do we know that something is an inorganic acid? And the answer to that question is the following. When placed in water, it will disassociate into, number one, one or more hydrogen ions. And number two, one or more anion. Okay. So if we were to draw a, a formula, what we would do is with an acid placed in water is going to disassociate into this plus an anion. And anions carry a negative charge. So cations have a positive charge, anions have a negative charge. So an acid, when placed in water, does this, disassociates it. A classic example would be this. We get this plus that. 
so that's an acid. And acids turn out to be a very important part of our biology. Um, and particularly when we get into the respiratory system, for example, and the urinary system, you're going to spend some time talking about uh, acids. Um, your body is constantly producing uh, acids as a normal uh, byproduct of metabolism. And acids, particularly the hydrogen ions, can be very disruptive, particularly with the structure of proteins. So one of your body, one of the things that your body is constantly dealing with is the uh, constant production of hydrogen ions and how to deal with them. And of course, being that you produce a lot of them and being that they are very important in terms of what they can do to the structure of proteins, um, there are a lot of mechanisms which your body has uh, to deal with acids. So we'll, you'll, you'll get into that conversation later in 40, um, 40B and 40C. Okay. Well, let's talk about a base then. What is an inorganic base? Well, it's going to disassociate into number one, one or more hydroxyl groups. That's this. It's called a hydroxyl group, OH. And you see, you notice it has a negative charge to it. And number two, one oh, or more cation. Okay. And remember, cations has a have a positive charge. If you ever uh, forget, just look at that T. That T is a plus sign. If you think of it that way, then a cation has a positive charge. Okay. So in this case. A base, when placed in the water, will disassociate into this plus a cation. And we can use sodium hydroxide as an example. We place it in the water and we get this. And there is our positive charge. Okay, so that's a base. So we have an acid, we have a base, and we also have what we call a salt. So let's take a look at what we mean when we say a salt. Okay. So a salt is defined as when it's placed in water, it disassociates into number one one an anion number two a cation and number three in our definition neither of the above can be a hydrogen or ion a hydrogen ion or a hydroxyl group so we eliminate those two as a possibility. It can be anything else but those two. If we have an anion and a cation, once we place it into a beaker of water, um, we have a salt. So if we look at that, we look at a salt placed in water is going to produce a cation plus an anion. And, of course, the class example is something that you have at home, used in cooking and found in all your foods. Your cation, remember, has a positive charge, so there is the cation. The anion has a negative charge, and so there is that. You notice that neither of these is a hydrogen ion or a hydroxyl group, and so it fits that definition. That is a salt. Okay. So let's take a look or let's quickly review what we just wrote down in our notes. I'm going to remove this and I'll come back to this in just a second. But here we go. 
So in this side we have an acid. We have hydrochloric acid. We place it in water. It disassociates into one or more hydrogen ions, in this case only one, and a negatively charged anion. The base, on the other hand, once you put it in water, disassociates. Uh, one of those can be one or more of the hydroxyl group and then a cation. And here we have uh, potassium chloride and we can put that in water and it can disassociate into that uh, cation and that anion. So that's a acid, base, and salt. Okay. So potassium chloride, potassium hydroxide, and uh, hydrochloric acid. All right. The other thing that we want to uh, emphasize here in this lecture, or what I want to talk about in this lecture, is the pH scale. So here is an example of pH scale. And let me get this right so we can read it in English. Here we go. Yeah, so here's my pH scale. Uh, a little messy, but we'll figure it out. So um, pH scale, um, here's, here's the scale. It starts from 0, goes all the way up to 14. 7 is neutral. Any number greater than 7 means that you have a base. So all of these numbers represent um, a solution which is basic. And anything less than 7 is going to be an acid. So, for example, I put in some, here's, a, oh, here's where orange juice would be sitting. So uh, you get up in the morning, you have a cup of orange juice. It's an acidic. In fact, most of the drinks that we consume, coffee, tea, orange juice, uh, all the soda pops that we drink, um, they are acidic, and orange juice sits somewhere right here between um, uh, 3 and 4 on the pH scale. Your stomach produces a very acidic environment, as you can see right here. Um, so look at those numbers, 1 or 2, very, very acidic. That is the condition of your stomach when you are consuming a meal. Over here, we have bile, that's lye, milk and magnesia. So basically, this is a scale that measures whether a solution is going to be acidic, neutral, or basic. So let me just kind of emphasize that. By the way, um, let me give you some numbers just to give a sense of uh, the pH scale. Come back in here. There you go. All right. Uh, so let me just turn to some examples. So, so some examples. of common uh, solutions and their pH. Okay, so uh, your stomach can reach 1 to 2 on the pH scale. Um, OJ is around 3.5 on the pH. Yeah. Urine ranges quite a bit. It can go. It can be acidic. It can be basic, but a lot of urine um, is um, close to the neutral. Uh, but it can go from point, uh, 4.6 to 8.0. That's the normal range. So depending a lot on what you eat. Um, and what's going on in your body, your urine can be uh, pretty acidic or very basic. Um, and you're going to learn more about that when you do the chapter on the urinary system. Saliva is around 6.35 to around 6.85. Now, is that acidic or basic? You know, 6.85, that's really close to 7. So is that really acidic? Absolutely. It's less than 7. Any number less than 7. So that's not much less than 7, but it's still less than 7. So that's still an acidic condition. 
What about blood? Well, blood has a range of 7.35 to 7.45. And so now we are talking about a basic. So larger than seven, and this makes that uh, basic. Um, and then we had an example of lie, which is uh, way out here in the 14 range. So um, that gives you a sense of where various common uh, um, fluids that, you are, that you're going to be dealing with and talking about uh, where they lie on that pH scale. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on. And we're going to change the subject slightly. And we're going to talk about, as I mentioned before, things that are referred to as solutions, colloids, and suspensions. Of these three types of mixtures, the most common that we will be talking about in this course, as well as 40B and 40C, are solutions. So you're going to be dealing with solutions a lot. Um, so that's something you definitely really need to understand exactly what it is. It's not that difficult. And colloids, we do have a number of examples of colloids in the body. And we have at least one example of a suspension in the body. Um, so, But this is not that common. This one is very common. This one is somewhere in between, and this one is uh, not very common at all. So all of these are examples of a mixture. So let's go ahead and say, what is a mixture? What are we talking about when we use this term mixture? And this is going to be defined as a combination of elements or compounds, and we now know what a compound is, right? That are mixed together or blended together but not chemically bonded together. So we're going to throw them into a blender and they're going to be all bunched together, but they're not going to be bonded in some um, chemical way. Hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, covalent bonds, what have you. None of that is present in a mixture. Okay. So there are three types of liquid mixtures. So mixtures can come in both the liquid form and a solid state. Um, we're going to look at the mixed uh, liquid mixtures because, um, again, we're going back to our original uh, discussion of the body and the body fluid compartment. So um, all of this that we are talking about are happening inside those liquid body uh, compartments. Um, and so they are so critical to the way we work um, and what goes on in terms of our metabolism and physiology. So that's why we're just going to focus on the liquid mixtures. And the first one is solutions. Okay. So solution is a combination of, number one, a solvent And typically, this is the most abundant um, part of a solution. So this is this is usually is more uh, than the other. It's the second part, which I haven't mentioned yet. So uh, most abundant and for us, it's going to be water. It doesn't have to be water. But because we're dealing with a biological entity, the human being, 
it's going to be water, okay? So it's a, a combination of a solvent and solutes. And the solutes are evenly dispersed. in the solvent. Okay. Furthermore, the solutes are very small. They're very small. And this is a critical uh, part of the definition and I'll explain that in just a moment here. So. We have a combination of a solvent and a solute, and we can actually write that as a, an equation, if you notice. So, uh, solution equals the solvent plus the solute. And the reason I wrote that equation down is we're going to use that in the lab. And when we talk about osmosis, this is going to be a very important uh, um, equation, and we'll be able to talk about osmosis and the movement of water uh, and predict what happens to cells in different kinds of solutions based on this equation. Okay? Um, so, why do I say that they're very, very small, and why is that important? Because they're so small that gravity cannot um, pull them out of solution. So one of the things uh, about uh, solutions is that if, for example, you take a beaker of water and you pour salt into it, that's going to be a solution. It's going to be a combination of water plus the sodium chloride. Um, and if it didn't evaporate, you had found some way to keep that from evaporating, 100 years from now, you would still have salt water. The salt particles, the sodium and the chloride, would not be pulled out of solution by the force of gravity. And how do I know this? Take a look at our oceans. They have been around for billions of years, and they're still salty. If sodium chloride and the other small solutes that make up that solution we call an ocean were affected by gravity, by now, all those things would have been pulled out and would be at the bottom of the ocean. But they're not because they're so small um, that they can overcome the effects of a gravitational pull on them. Right. All right, so that's a solution. What are some examples? Well, I just gave you one. An example is sodium chloride plus water. So where is the solvent? Right here. Where is the solute? Right here. So those two together make it a solution. Okay. Okay. Solutions are also um, usually clear and transparent. clear and transparent. Why? Well, this goes back again to the fact that the solutes are very small. They're so small, they don't generally interact with light. So unless light interacts with something, you're not going to see it. So if you take, again, a baker of, uh, of water and pour salt in it, you're not going to really see any difference. It's going to be transparent. It's going to be clear. You're not going to be able to see the suspended sodium chloride in there because the, those molecules are so small, light does not interact with them. Okay. All right, so that's a solution. What about a colloid? Well, what about a colloid? Let's talk about it. A colloid is going to be a mixture of a solvent and larger solutes. Okay. Large enough 
to scatter light. In other words, you would be able to see the difference because the solutes now are large enough so that light is interacting with them and scattering it and causing that to be um, uh, visible. So in other words, another way we can describe this is, is that it's translucent as opposed to transparent. It's translucent or sometimes, depending on the size, opaque. All right, let me give you an example. I told you already, if we put salt in a beaker of water, you're not going to see any change in the color or the nature of that water. It's going to be clear. It's going to be transparent. If you put dye, so like you're preparing to dye eggs of something like that, then what do you get? You definitely see a change in the consistency or the translucency or the transparency of that water. So that's an example of a colloid because now we have larger uh, particles and they interact with light. Um, an example um, would be uh, tea. So when you put a tea bag in water, that water is no longer clear. Um, it becomes uh, more translucent or even opaque, depending on how uh, thick and rich the tea is. Um, and, and, it, and again, with a colloid, the, uh, the particles or solutes are not large enough. to settle out. of solution. And so once again, even though they are large and they're interacting with light, they're not large enough for gravity to eventually pull them out of solution and collect them at the bottom of the beaker or whatever container that is holding that colloid. Okay. So where in our body is an example of a colloid? And that would be blood. So blood is a colloid. And that is because of the proteins in blood. Uh-huh. Make it a colloid. So the plasma, the, the liquid part of blood, contains proteins. These are large enough to interact with light. And they're still small enough that we won't come out of solution. So that's a colloid. As a matter of fact, blood is also a solution. Because in addition to the proteins, we also have sodium and a bunch of other ions dissolved in the blood. And so that makes it not just a colloid, but also a solution. So it, it, uh, you can be, you can have, as we have in the case of blood, a, um, a mixture which is both a solution and a colloid. In fact, you can have one that's both a mixture, a, uh, a mixture that is both a solution, a colloid, and a suspension, because blood also fits that definition as well. So when you get to talking about the circulatory system and blood vessels, you're going to run into this. You're going to run into something that's called blood colloid osmotic pressure. What is that? Well, let's break it down. Obviously, we're talking about blood. Colloid. In this case, the thing that makes blood a colloid is the proteins. And osmotic pressure, we haven't talked about that, but we will. So blood has a pressure that can drive the movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane. And that particular um, pressure or that particular force, I should say, uh, is called blood colloid osmotic pressure. 
colloid because of the size of the particles that make up that osmotic pressure. And hopefully you will remember this little uh, moment in 40A when you get to 40B and you start talking about um, start talking about uh, capillaries and how mo a water moves into and out of a capillary. Right. All right. Well, that leaves the last one, which is a suspension. And a suspension is a mixture of still larger particles. Large enough to settle out over time. Okay. Um, and we have one example in the body, and that is blood. So when you take a sample of blood and say that you put it in a test tube, what you would see um, when you first did that is a, uh, yeah, let's see, it would look something like this. And then over time, if you let it sit there and you came back and looked at it, what you would see is something like this. There would be a clear fluid. So this would be clear, and this would be red. This represents blood, red blood cells, okay? Um, and over time, blood will um, separate, and you'll have a, a bit of clear solution at the top, and then at the bottom, you would have um, the collection of red blood cells because gravity has pulled them out of solution. So it starts off as a suspension, and then over time, the blood cells are large enough to interact with gravity. They're pulled out of uh, suspension, and you have... Um, and you have uh, what we call a suspension um, because the separation of the um, blood cells from the blood plasma. Okay. Now, this clear part is an example of a colloid and a solution. Okay. All right. So that's just a matter of definition so that when we use these terms, you understand what we're talking about. Um, what I'd like to do now is go ahead and get into organic compounds. And we're going to spend most of our time here talking about organic compounds. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and we'll start off with a fresh page. So we're going to talk about organic compounds. These are going to compose about 40 to 45 percent of your total body mass. And what is the rest of your total body mass? Water, of course. So we went through that already. Um, so the organic compounds that you're composed of represent less than half your total body mass. Um, and they fall into four main types number one carbohydrates number two lipids number three proteins number four nucleic acids and under nucleic acids I want to talk about ATP because that is a critical molecule and you should have some idea of how it's put together and why it plays such a crucial role 
in your biology. So we're going to cover that. So remember, when we talk about organic compounds, we're talking about something that contains the element carbon. Why is it that carbon is playing this very special role such that we can talk about a whole group of compounds that are exclusively referred to as organic compounds? So let's take a moment and just kind of consider why carbon? Why carbon? So carbon has some interesting properties. And one of the properties that it has, it can form four covalent Let me get that right. Covalent bonds. Okay. Four covalent bonds. So if we have a carbon molecule, it can bond to four different things in this fashion. All right, well, what's the big deal? Well, if you see this, you can see, I think quite easily, that if you have something that can connect to four other things in just this kind of pattern, you can build some interesting structures from this. So carbon lends itself to building complex molecules. So carbon can be used as the backbone to build very complex molecules because it has the capacity to bond to four different things to four to form four, four covalent bonds in just uh, roughly this configuration that we see right here. So if I take a bunch of carbons and string them together, I can create a long chain of carbons and then as I do that, I can start hooking um, other things to that carbon. So let's say I have a long chain of carbons here. And as you know, each one of these carbons is capable of bonding to four different things. And all I have to do is start adding these side groups here. And now I can start getting some very interesting molecules as I start building this up and adding what we call um, functional groups. So I can add functional groups to long chains of carbons. and form um, complex molecules. Those functional groups can have some very interesting properties. So the functional groups can change the nature of that chain of carbons. And we're going to see this play out when we look at the difference between um, sugars, lipids, and proteins. We're going to see how, by just simply uh, changing the type of functional groups we attach to carbons, we can produce vastly different types of molecules. Okay. All right. So, there's some terminology that we should master as we talk about these organic compounds because they're being used to describe various types of these organic molecules. So let's talk about some terms. One of those terms is called a macromolecule, or one of those terms is a macromolecule. What is a macromolecule? When we use that word, what do we mean? A macromolecule is composed of many 
smaller subunits. Okay. So it's just a very large molecule composed of many smaller subunits. A second term is a polymer. And a polymer is composed of many smaller subunits, all of the same kind. So macromolecules, many smaller subunits, but it doesn't say anything about the subunits, just a lot of them. Polymer is saying something very, very uh, particular, very specific about those subunits. They're all the same. They're all the same subunit. That would be a polymer. Okay. The subunits that I'm referring to have a name. So subunits... are called monomers. So that's just some terminology that you should be familiar with so that when I use it, you'll know what I'm talking about. All right. Well, let's get into the interesting part. This is uh, describing each of these four macromolecules, organic macromolecules. Uh, so carbohydrates are going to be the first thing on our list. However, before we do that, before we get into that discussion on carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and so forth, I want to call your attention back to something, a table that we had actually looked at earlier. Um, so let's come back to this, and I want to draw your attention. If you remember, this is in Chapter 2. This is the main chemical elements in the body and I have broken down uh, this with, uh, with you before. So oxygen is making up 65% of, uh, this is percent total body mass, um, and that's percentage, so that's 65% um, of, of that total, of that 40 to 45, uh, 50 to 45 um, total body mass uh, is, 65% of that is oxygen. Carbon, 18, hydrogen is nine, Nitrogen is 3.2, and then all the rest are less. There are quite a few, as you can see on this list, and this is not a complete list. Um, but the reason I want to come back and look at this is because as we go through and describe each of these macromolecules that we're going to look at, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, I want to keep these numbers in mind. Um, carbon is surprisingly playing a less, in terms of percentage, uh, less than oxygen. So oxygen is really, really abundant in your body. And carbon comes in second to that. So just keep this in mind um, as we go through and describe what all of these things are. So we'll start off with um, carbohydrates. And let's go ahead and take a look at a typical carbohydrate. Um, well, actually, let's go ahead and define this. So what we're talking about are sugars. Uh, a unscientific term to describe carbohydrates um, is they are sugars. Okay. And there are different types of carbohydrates or different types of sugar. And I'm just going to mention three right off the top just to get into this discussion. One is starch. Okay. This is a polymer. What does that mean? Polymer. We just talked about that. What does what is a polymer? Does anybody remember? Let's go back and see what our definition of a polymer is. And a polymer is composed of many smaller subunits, all of the same kind. Okay. So starch fulfills that definition. The subunit or monomer is glucose. And it is, interestingly, a plant product. Plants produce starch. And 
it is the storage. Uh, of energy in the plant. This is how the plant stores energy. Starch. Number two. Glycogen. Okay. This is also a polymer. And the monomer... is glucose. So why don't we call it starch? A couple of reasons. One is that this is produced by animals. This is a product of animal metabolism. Starch is a product of um, uh, plant metabolism. They are cons they consist of the same they consist of the very same monomer but the way those monomers are hooked together make it uh, make it different make them a different uh, animal so here i will remove this this is a polymer and as you can see all of the subunits are the same and the monomer is glucose and this is how a typical molecule of glycogen would look now, if you had a similar picture of starch, the chains and the way the branching pattern would be different. The way the glucose molecules are hooked, excuse me, hooked together are, is different. So because of that larger sort of structural difference, we are talking about two different types of molecules, starch and glycogen. One produced by plants, one produced by animals. Fortunately for us, we have the enzymes to break down both starch and glycogen. That is not true, however, for the next example I want to give you of a, uh, of a sugar. And this is cellulose. This is also a polymer. And once again, the monomer... is glucose okay. and typically or uh, not typically but this is the most plentiful organic compound on earth cellulose Again, made up of glucose, but unfortunately for us, we don't have the right enzymes to break down this molecule. It's composed of glucose. We can utilize glucose as a source of energy in our body if we could break this molecule apart, but we can't. If we eat glycogen, yes. If we eat starch, yes, but not cellulose. So, and one of the reasons I make this list and talk about this is to drive home a couple of points. I want to talk about polymers, I want to talk about monomers, I want to talk about the importance of glucose, but I also am pointing to you, pointing out to you that um, the importance of enzymes, um, in this case the importance of enzymes to break down our food, and the fact that, um, that um, those enzymes are very specific and the kinds of things that they can work on. So you're going to talk more about this in the digestive when you do the chapter on the digestive tract. So this is just a couple examples of what we are calling carbohydrates. Um, okay, so let's move on and let's talk about what a carbohydrate is composed of. So it is composed of one carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. 
the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is 2 to 1. 2 to 1. So for every carbon, usually you have one water molecule. And that's how it got its name. Carbohydrate. Carbohydrate. Carbo carbon hydrate water okay. now notice I use the word usually so this is typical but not always the case let's take a look at um, an example here um, and so this is this is actually glucose so let's take a look at glucose and let's see if this pattern of two to one holds up in this molecule. So I'm gonna put this to the side. We'll come and look at this now. And I gotta get it so we can read it in English. Here we go. All right. All right, so take a look. Um, so this is the more complex form of the, um, of the uh, molecule, the chemical formula. And this is a simplified version of this. By the way, please do not Try to copy this down into your notes. I'm never going to ask you a question about this um, chemical formula. Um, so you will not have to reproduce that on some sort of test. But let's go ahead and take a look at each of the carbons. We'll start right here. Here's one carbon. We have two hydrogens and an oxygen. There's another carbon, two hydrogens and an oxygen. Another carbon, two hydrogens and an oxygen. Another, same thing here. You get a little bit different here because we have this carbon. It's hooked up to a second carbon. So that's why I said usually because it's not always the case. But certainly, and here's another exception to that where we have an additional hydrogen rather than just two hydrogens. We have three hydrogens and the oxygen. And then we have an oxygen all out here by itself. The other thing I want to point out to you is this combination right here you see that oxygen and that hydrogen hooked together and you can see it all around that same combination um, remember when we looked at water and we noticed that oxygen was capable of holding on to the electron a little bit harder than the proton of the hydrogen so that it created a polar or polarity in water molecule it created a polar molecule well, a similar type of thing is happening right here. Oxygen is, in fact, holding on to that electron a little bit harder than that hydrogen. So there is um, some polarity in the system here, which makes this then soluble in water. That's why sugars are typically soluble in water. It's because they have these combinations of oxygen and hydrogen connected to so many carbons. Um, so, that's, um, so that's our um, sort of our backbone to what a carbon is. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, yeah, let's talk about functions now. What do carbohydrates do for us? Why do we consume them? Why do we use them? What and how do we use them? So functions. Um, the number one function for carbohydrates is to provide energy. Okay. We're going to take carbohydrates and through a complex series of metabolic uh, pathways, we're going to produce a usable source of energy called ATP. So we're going to take the, carbo uh, the carbohydrate, break it down uh, into its components, glucose. Then we're going to feed glucose into a metabolic pathway and out the other end comes some ATP that we can use to drive the reactions that we need to stay alive. So energy is the number one function that um, carbohydrates are used, being, are used for. But not entirely just energy. So there is some structural 
there is some structural components in our body that are uh, carbohydrates. So for example, when we look at DNA or RNA, we'll see that um, sugar makes up uh, the backbone of those molecules. Um, we also attach sugars to proteins and other molecules such as lipids. So they do have some structural functions in our body as well. Okay. Now, when we look at carbohydrates as a group, we can break them down or can break that very large group into some categories, some subcategories to help us understand um, and categorize this very large and diverse group of things that we call carbohydrates. So we're going to divide it into three major groups. And these three major groups work well for biology. If you were a chemist, you might want to go down a different path in terms of how you're going to divide up carbohydrates. But for us, for this class, we're going to use three major groups. And those groups are, number one, what we call monosaccharides. Monosaccharides. Okay. Sometimes referred to as simple sugars. But again, I emphasize that simple sugar is not a scientific term. Uh, it is, does not have a precise definition. So monosaccharide is also called a simple sugar, and you can get away with that, but it's starting to get a little bit shaky in terms of your ability to uh, closely and carefully define what you're talking about. So some examples are uh, glucose. We have already talked about that. Fructose. This, of course, comes from fruit. You can see the name. Galactose. And that's found in milk. It's a sugar found in milk. Uh, ribose. Ribose is found in RNA. So there's your structural component. Deoxyribose. This would be your DNA. Again, that's an uh, example of a structural use of sugars. Okay. So that's one category, monosaccharides. Another category or another way to divide this very large group is by disaccharides. So disaccharide is two sugars. that are bonded together by covalent bond. Okay. So if, for example, we take um, glucose plus fructose and hook those together, what we get is sucrose. And sucrose is table sugar. It's what you have at home. It's the sugar that you have at home. Some other examples are lactose and maltose. Those are all examples of disaccharides two sugars. Okay. From two sugars, we're going to go to polysaccharides. Now, depending on what textbook and what instructor you have, you might have stopped before you got to polysaccharides to uh, trisaccharides, um, and you can go on and on, but I'm going to jump right away after a disaccharide into what we call a polysaccharide. And this is uh, many uh, sugars bonded together. Typical, you're talking about tens to hundreds. 
monosaccharides. What would be an example of a polysaccharide? We talked about, in fact, right at the beginning, right at the top of the discussion of carbohydrates, we talked about uh, uh, three examples of a polysaccharide, glucose, um, glycogen, and cellulose, all examples of polysaccharides, many sugars hooked together. Okay, all right. All right, so some examples then of a disaccharide. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick look at that. Here we go. And I'm going to get this out of the way so it's not distracting our focus here. Okay, let's move in a little bit. All right, so we're going to get glucose and fructose, and we're going to hook those two together, and we end up with sucrose. Notice this reaction. We're going to extract a water molecule. That's called dehydration synthesis. Okay, so when that when we extract that water molecule, we're going to hook these two together through a covalent bond, and we're going to get sucrose, and we're going to get the water out of it. Now we can go backwards. So if you eat table sugar, in your body you consume this molecule. This molecule will be broken down. To break it down, you're going to need water because you're going to break this bond right here and use water to tape off those two sticky ends right there. And that would be a hydrolysis. So you're going to go backwards. You're going to end up with that water molecule being split apart, hydrolysis, and we're going to end up with two separate molecules. This is exactly what happens to your digestive tract. So you absorb glucose and you absorb fructose individually as monomers or excuse me as monosaccharides when you eat this disaccharide in your digestive tract okay and of course this reaction is being driven by an enzyme which we'll be talking about later okay. all right well let's move on and let's talk about lipids So lipids, again, very large and diverse group, and we're going to break this very large and diverse group into uh, simpler um, groupings so we can uh, look at them and understand them a little bit better. And we're going to break this down into triglycerides, into phospholipids. and steroids. And the reason we're doing this is because these are very important molecules in our biology. So we're going to talk about triglycerides. We want to understand what they are because we're going to be running into those quite a bit. We'll also be looking at phospholipids quite a bit. And we also, especially when you get into the chapter on the endocrine system, talking about steroids. So these are all examples of lipids, very specific types of lipids. So let's go through and let's talk about what this is composed of. So we're going to have carbon. We're going to have hydrogen. And we're going to have oxygen. Okay. And so far this list looks very, very similar to the list we made when we talked about carbohydrates. So at this point of, in our discussion, I see no difference between carbohydrate and a lipid. How are we going to make that distinction? Why are we calling these two things different things? And the answer to that is less oxygen. Now this is a very important observation. This is a very important fact. Less oxygen. Why? Well, remember when we were talking about when we were talking about sugars, I pointed out there were a lot of bonds between oxygen and hydrogen. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. So if we look at this, we can see that this carbon, 
So there's that oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. We have a lot of those in all of the sugars. And because of that connection between the oxygen and hydrogen, we're going to get some polarity here. And that means that the sugars can be dissolved in water. But if I start removing a lot of these oxygens, then that polarity goes away. And if it goes away, then it becomes harder and harder for me to take that molecule and dissolve it in water. So with less oxygen, what we're talking about is we're creating a, a macromolecule now that has a difficult time dissolving in water. So there are fewer polar bonds. Okay. And it becomes, uh, so that becomes that most of the lipids are insoluble. in water because it has less oxygen okay. as I said three major groups that we're gonna pay attention to anyway and the first of those is triglycerides so let's go ahead and get that into our notes we're gonna talk about triglycerides first Triglyceride. So a triglyceride is composed of number one, one glycerol molecule, and number two, three fatty acids three tri okay three fatty acids let's go ahead and look at an example of what we're talking about so triglyceride is going to look like this so here is uh, you can see highlighted in this light blue my glycerol molecule and you can see carbons once again carbons all hooked together here uh, and here we do have that polar bond happening right there, but we're going to get rid of that when we hook the um, fatty acid to it. So I'm going to take, and there it is, a long chain of carbons, all of which are attached to hydrogen, as you can see. I don't, there's the only oxygen right there. It's not even attached to hydrogen. So I'm not going to get any polarity here. Certainly don't get any polarity there. And the molecule that would have polarity, I'm going to remove that polarity because I'm going to extract a water molecule and hook this chain on there. And when I do that, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get three fatty acids hooked to that backbone, that glycerol molecule, and that is my triglyceride. Get rid of this underneath that so you can see it better. So there is my triglyceride. I don't see any polar bonds here. And as such, this is not going to dissolve in water. Notice something interesting here. This is a fatty acid. And so, by the way, this is a palmitic acid. That's the name of this fatty acid. Um, and you can hook different types of fatty acids on there. So there's not just one single type. Um, there are a, a, a many, many types of uh, fatty acids that you can create, use to create a triglyceride. Uh, and in this case, this fatty acid right here has a double bond. So what happened is we took a carbon, we removed one of the hydrogens, and we use that bond to connect it to the neighboring carbon. And when that happens, I, I bend the chain like this. You see, I've got this little dog leg, this little bend here. And when that happens, I'm removing a hydrogen, so it becomes monounsaturated, a single unsaturated carbon, as opposed to both of these, which are saturated. Each carbon has the maximum amount of hydrogens attached to it. So that's a, this is a saturated fat, 
This is a monounsaturated fat. And if I had a polyunsaturated fat, I would have many double bonds in one of or more of the fatty acids. Okay. So this is an example then of a triglyceride. So triglycerides. I'm going to build for our notes a triglyceride and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to identify this. This is my glycerol molecule. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook a long series. I'm not going to draw the oxygen connection in there. Um, I'm just because I'm just going to get the pattern. And I'm not going to certainly draw all the hydrogens because what we're doing is simply creating a form that we can readily identify as a triglyceride. And so these are my fatty acids. And that gives me my triglyceride. So often you can see this, something like this. Very simple drawing. Sometimes people do that to represent a triglyceride. Um, I want to say a little bit, something a little bit more about the uh, uh, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. Um, so let's go ahead polyunsaturated fatty acids um, are plant based fatty acids saturated fatty acids are animal based fatty acids. If you have a polyunsaturated fatty acid, you have many double bonds and that means that the little legs, there's a lot of this going on a lot of bending and that has significance as to way as to how those molecules are going to behave at room temperature let's let's expand on that so i'm going to write i'm going to hear this would be a saturated triglyceride and i would have this okay and if I bring another molecule next to it, I can get these very, very close together. Very close together because there's no bending of the fatty acids. But if I have a poly unsaturated triglyceride, What you're going to get is this. And when I bring two together, it's going to be very difficult for them to get close to each other. So why? Why is that significant? Because at room temperature, these molecules are very close to each other and they form a solid. At room temperature, these molecules are further away and they are a liquid. So plant-based fats 
generally tend to be a liquid at room temperature. So we're talking about olive oil, peanut oil, corn oil, so forth and so on. But animal-based fats here, they tend to be solid at room temperature. So that's your white marbly in uh, part of the meats that you buy if you buy a steak and so forth and so on. So um, it's, it's the molecular difference in the, and the introduction of these double bonds that cause that to, um, to, um, to have these little kinks and forcing the molecules further apart and thus they become liquid at room temperature as opposed to a solid at room temperature. Okay. All right. Well, that's triglycerides. Let's talk about phospholipids. Phospholipids. Now, phospholipid is composed of number one, a glycerol molecule. And there's a C right there, forgot that. Okay. A glycerol molecule. And number two, two fatty acids. Right. So not three. And the third thing is going to be a phospho uh, a phosphate group, I should say. And by adding that phosphate group, we get some very, very interesting properties from what used to be um, an insoluble molecule and turning it into a soluble molecule. So let's go ahead and take a look at an image and then we'll draw it into our notes. So I'll set this aside for the time being. And we'll come back to that. So here we are. And if you look carefully right here, there is my glycerol backbone, three carbons. And here are my two fatty acids, okay? Uh, and over here, I've added, instead of another fatty acid, I've added this polar molecule. This is a phosphate group. And notice I've got charges here. So if I have charges, what about this head? This part of this molecule can dissolve in water. This part doesn't want to be with water, but this part does. So we get this kind of bipolar structure in the molecule so that half of it or part of it, the so-called polar head, it can mix with water and the nonpolar tails um, avoid mixing with water. So if I have a bunch of these molecules in a beaker and I pour them into water, they will automatically arrange themselves in this pattern with the heads facing out towards water because they have that charge and they can mix with water and the tail sequestered between um, the two layers of polar heads. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how our cell membranes are put together. So a phospholipid is critical in our biology because it creates the cell membrane, the plasma membrane that make up all of our trillions and trillions of different cells in our body. And it's simply because of this arrangement with the polar head and the nonpolar tails. Okay. So let's get that into our notes. So we end up then, and I'm going to draw a very simple drawing. Uh, to We're going to end up with something like this. Okay. And so this part right here is the non-polar two fatty acids. And that is hydrophobic. And this part right here which I will color in. That part right there 
is our polar head. And this is our phosphate group. And this is going to be hydrophilic. Okay. When we pour a bunch of these to, or when we have a bunch of these molecules in water, what you're going to see is this arrangement. This is called a lipid bilayer. A lipid bilayer. So let's go ahead and draw that first. And then we'll explain what the terminology is. And so we get this is called a lipid bilayer. Lipid, it's a composed of layer, bilayer, two layers of lipids. And this is going to be our cell membrane. All because of the nature of this molecule having one part of it being polar and dissolvable in water and the other part nonpolar and avoiding mixing with water. The last, the last group um, within this broad category of lipids are steroids. And steroids are a four ring or four rings of carbon. That's probably a better way of putting it. And it is, they are all derived from cholesterol. So that is the beginning point of all of the steroids in our body. Let's go ahead and take a look at a picture of that. All right, here we go. So here's our cholesterol, four rings, one, two, three, four, and we begin there. And then we can modify this structure in various ways to produce a variety of different steroid hormones. So, so estrogen, you can see that is quite a bit different from our starting point. We still have the four rings, of course. Uh, here is testosterone. Again, four rings, but again, modified from the original cholesterol. Uh, cortisol, this is so-called stress hormone. Again, four rings. All of this is, are all of these uh, are steroids that are modified cholesterol molecules. And that really is all we need to know about um, steroids. So, that brings us to proteins. And I think what I'd like to do now is take a break and come back with another lecture in which we're going to focus on proteins and nucleic acids. It won't be a, a very long lecture, uh, but I don't want to extend these lectures on for um, greater than an, more than an hour if I can. Um, so I'm going to stop here. And the next lecture, which would be session three um, for chapter two, we'll finish this discussion on uh, organic compounds with proteins and nucleic acids. So thank you very much for tuning in once again. Uh, have a nice day or evening, and I will see you later.